Hi, my name is Jonathan Hopp. This is 10 Minute Go, where I teach you a lesson on the game of Go in less than 10 minutes, starting now. All right, so today's lesson is the co-rule, all right? It's very important to learn the co-rule because it's one of the basic rules of the game. And I teach it later on in the series, you know, I know it's one of the basic rules, but I teach it at this point in the series because it gets to be a little bit complicated for beginners. So try to concentrate as much as you can today because it'll get a little bit scary. All right, so let's say we have a board like this, all right? We've got black up in here, we got this sort of like flower looking shape in the middle. All right, by the way, ko is a Japanese word. It's called pe in Korean and uh, datie in um, Chinese. So I want you to kind of understand that Americans use, Americans and Europeans, we use Japanese terms, uh, mainly because that's who taught us the game was the Japanese. So we ended, we didn't we didn't have English for ko, so we just used their word. Um, it, had it been the other way around, we would have used Chinese words. The Chinese had been the first people to introduce it to us. So. It just depends who got there first. So just kind of understand that the three languages are not the same, and they have vastly different vocabulary for the game of Go. Now, here is we have an interesting position. White has one liberty here. That means that if black covers this point at F3, then we can take the stone at E3. Now, some people usually get a little bit confused because they say, well, wait a second, Jonathan. You said you cannot put a stone down on the board where it will automatically run out of liberties and die. You are correct. I did say that. And it's still, I have not contradicted myself in the slightest. After black takes to f3, the black stone has one liberty here. Why? Because you kill the white stone. In killing e3 and taking away its last liberty, you've ensured yourself a liberty for yourself. So when you put the black f3 stone down on the board, you've automatically captured the white stone, and then you have an extra liberty at e3, which means you are Atari, but you are not, uh, this is a legal move. You are not automatically run out of liberties. Now, Here's the catch. Let's say this was important. Let's say uh, black captures uh, E3. Now, white cannot capture back. Here's why. If we allow white to just capture back, then this will go back and forth forever. It'd be black captures, white captures, black captures, white captures, blah, 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 go on forever. All right, so we don't want that. We want the game to continue, especially if both players really, really, really want um, this to control this point. And sometimes it happens. Sometimes it's very important to control um, a certain point of the game. So white cannot take black back. White must change the overall board position. All right. What that means is, like, take a snapshot. Go. Here's what the board looks like now. All right. And so white can play elsewhere. And now this board and this board are different, right? Look at every at the position of every single stone on the board. Now the whole board position is different because there's a stone here at G5 where there was not a stone. Now, here's this is where Go is kind of like boxing, all right? Boxers go in and then they put you know they put up their dukes and they start jabbing at each other. Like they start testing each other at the very beginning to see if the other one will, will react. If usually the guy doesn't react, they just sit there, you know, knock, and then eventually they start going, you know, going at each other. But here, kind of like in Go, when you play a move like G5, it doesn't necessarily make Black need to do anything. Black doesn't feel any sense of urgency to defend against your move, so Black may just choose to protect at E3. Perfectly fine move, all right? So G5 does not have enough punch to it. We need to have a little bit of a zingier move. So it has to have a threat behind it. We need to find a co-threat. All right, so you're going to find a co-threat. Some move that if black ignores it, then black will suffer in some kind of way. I've got such a move. Let's try B9. C9 was also works just as well. Now, B9 in and of itself is not a good move because it doesn't actually work to kill black. Let's say um, these black stones are behind a white wall, so if black does not defend, he will die. But how should black defend to live? Pause the video, think about it. C9 is the vital point, all right? This is where you play so that you don't die, all right? Now, D9 is an illegal move for white, and A9 is an illegal move for white, because if you put the stone on either of those points, they will automatically run out of liberties and die. So, that being the case, black cannot be lowered to zero liberties because of the rules of the game, and therefore black is alive. These stones cannot be captured ever. So, it's true that white, you know, white played this B9 move and black was forced to respond. But now this position, where every, look at every stone on the board, the overall position of the board, compared to this is different. Because now there's this position, and this position has two more stones, which means white can take back. That's the co-rule, all right? You cannot take back immediately. You must change the overall board position by playing somewhere else, and then you can take back. Now, the reason we did it this way is because if I just play somewhere else by itself, that does not necessarily mean black is going to respond to G5. 
Whereas if I play like this, black will respond to this unless he wants to die. All right. So for example, let's say black doesn't believe you. All right. Black's like, well, whatever. I don't care. I really think this is an important point. I'm going to protect e3. Good job. You go ahead and do that. Where should white play to punish black? Pause the video. Take a second to think about it. All right. Well, if c9 was the vital point to live, then c9 is also the vital point to kill. All right. It's the critical point. It's the crux of the situation. Now black is dead. Uh, I got a great question from one of my viewers in the comment. At the end of the game, the E9 group, these black stones right here, they're dead. All right, there's nothing black can do. There's no means of escape. They're dead. There's no, there's no spinner or dice or anything. Because they're dead, there's no need to play anything else in this area. So at the end of the game, you will simply just pick up the stones from the board, put them in your go pile. You get one point for each stone, plus all of the territory underneath the stones. So you would get, there's six stones, so that means there's 12 points of territory, um, so there's six points of territory, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you get six points of territory, uh, just a territory, plus six points for the stone, which is 12, plus these two extra points here. So you get a total of 14 points, and that would be delicious. It's, very, it's great. So if black connecting at E3 is worth more than 14 points, he should go ahead and connect, because it'd be worth more. But if it's not, then black needs to respond. Okay, and so black will have to respond, then white can take back. Now black needs to find a co-threat, all right? Black needs to play somewhere else and change the board position. So, for example, black were to play, I don't know, anything. Now this board position is different than this one, so white might either connect, or if white responds to it, white can respond to it, and then it'll go back and forth, back and forth. Co-threat, response, take the co. Co-threat, response, take the co. That's how it basically goes back and forth until someone decides that either A, the co isn't important anymore, who cares about it, or B, someone connects and then will suffer damage from a co-threat. It just basically depends. Also make sure that your co-threat is actually a co-threat. That is a very big thing. Make sure that there is actually some threat behind it. B9, like, could, like visualize, in my mind what I do is I say, hey, what if I had two moves in a row? I play, my opponent completely ignores me, and then I play again. And you can try to see, well, what happens? Does my opponent suffer after that point? If they do, you've probably got a good code thread, and all you have to do after that point is figure out how much it's worth. But all that's pretty complicated, so don't worry about that too much right now. Now, I've got a beginner game where I had two beginners that are like basically like 20Q, 25Q. They played a very interesting game. All right, and we came up to this point where we had a possible co and... Black's got the right side, black made a two-eyed shape on the left, white's got some territory, but white's lower left group is in danger. It's not clear whether or not this group can live, okay? And we have this shape, so you probably have already figured out that it's going to be a co. It's black's turn. Black can take at d2, and now the white stone at e2 is dead and taken off the board. Now white's got some problems. The lower left white group does not have enough space for two eyes. If white connects his group, he's got one eye here, but eventually, I'm just going to try to make this like make this super duper clear, so that no one um, I'm just to ignore these moves. I'm just saying that basically, when Black plays this, if White takes, death, okay, which means since there is no logical means for White to live, then these White stones in the left corner are dead, and there's no need for any further moves. All right, that's something beginners have to really kind of get through their head that there's this it's like a causal chain. Okay, you throw the ball in the air, it will go up and then go back down due to the gravity. There's no randomness to it. All right, so black takes, and now white cannot take immediately back at E2 because of the co-rule. White has to find a, a co-threat, a decent co-threat, in order to take back this area. Now white's got a very, it's going to have a very, very hard time uh, from this point onward. So let's, let's say, for example, white tries to play something, anything. Does this move really force black to do anything? Not really. I mean, even if uh, after black takes, if you play here, then black plays here. Not really that big of a deal. So this one doesn't have any punch. Plus, if black just connects or takes, either which one doesn't matter, then the, all these white stones are dead. So white's got to find something. White might be able to attack this group, all right, by looking at its shape and saying, hey, I got to find some way of getting out of this pickle. Let's say white Ataris. If black takes, White takes, and now we've got kind of a difficult situation here. I think at this point, actually, white's pretty much still dead, so because black can play something like this. 
Okay, and yeah, yeah, it's a little bit complicated, so if you don't quite get it, that's fine. All right, so it looks like at this point, white doesn't really have any co-threats. And that kind of is a bad thing, right? So if white doesn't have any co-threats, then white's going to die. Now let's say, for example, white did play something, I don't know, like this, and then black actually were to respond, then white takes back. Now here's kind of a cool thing. The other thing I wanted to get, talk about this lecture is the idea of, of one step and two step. We're just doing one step right now, okay? But this is a two step co. If black connects, white's still not alive. If white connects here, I want you to pause the video. If you're black, how do you kill white? Okay, if you want to kill white, you play B1. Okay, so that's one of those vital point things we talked about earlier in the life and death series. All right, so that means that actually white is, has to play on B1 in order to live, but then again, black takes. So it looks like white's got some, it's, it's work cut out for him. All right, that's all I want to talk about with Co. If, that, if you want to go back over this video and look at the second example, that's fine. But as long as you understand that after black takes, white must play elsewhere and change the board position before he can take back, you're golden. All right, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. If you enjoyed it, just go right down there and see right down there. Hit like, hit subscribe, and tell all your friends about it. Because um, the big thing right now is to get Go into as many people's faces as possible. Because with all the, with the, with the craze surrounding AlphaGo, um, there's going to be a lot of people who are interested in playing the game, and, and you can do your part in helping build the Go community. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. I'll catch you next time.